welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, the podcast that brings you practical advice, lessons, and stories from senior leaders and thought leaders from around the world. The Strategy and Leadership Podcast is brought to you by SME Strategy, working with organizations around the world to create and implement their strategic plans. To learn more, visit smestrategy.net. And now, your host, Anthony Taylor. Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Eduardo Briseño. I hopefully got that perfect. Uh, he's the author of The Performance Paradox and the CEO of Growth.how. Eduardo, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Anthony, for having me. I'm excited to chat. I'm excited to learn more about your work. Um, why don't you tell our uh, listeners a little bit more about you, and then we'll get into the conversation. Sure. I am a public speaker and facilitator that helps companies develop cultures of learning and high performance. So in, in private previous careers, I worked in investment banking and in New York City, and I spent five years as a venture capital investor in Silicon Valley. And in 2016, I connected with Stanford professor Carol Dweck, who came, uh, coined the term growth mindset, and she's been my mentor ever since. And since then, I've been focused on helping people and organizations develop cultures of learning and high performance. That's awesome. So I guess the obvious first question, what is the performance paradox? The performance paradox is the kind of intuitive phenomenon that if we focus only on performing, our performance suffers. So if we just focus on getting things done as best as we know how, trying to minimize mistakes, we stagnate. That's a way to maximize immediate performance. So if I really want to do my best today or this week, then I can just focus on what I know works, trying to minimize mistakes. But if I do that every week, then I won't get better. In order to get better, we have to engage not only in the performance zone, but also in the learning zone, which is when we are going beyond the known, when we are asking questions, listening, experimenting, looking at mistakes, and that looks different than just focusing on only getting things done. Absolutely. So, I mean, when we talk about strategic planning, we think about working in the business versus working on the business. And what I find interesting about the performance zone is, well, yes, if you just keep doing, you're only going to be able to do at the level of your performance. So, how does that work, you know, as somebody who performs and performs and fails? Does that incorporate learning or do you look at the learning zone as specifically time out from doing things to improve your skills, to improve your abilities? No, so chapter three is about learning while doing, which is getting things done while you also improve. So you're getting things done with two goals in mind, to get things done and to get better or to learn and to build your skills, you can do that. Or, you know, there might be times that you just devote yourself to learning, like listening to a podcast, right? Or, or attending a course or reading a book. But with, with regards to mistakes, you know, uh, like chapter five is all about mistakes. And, and the thing about mistakes is that sometimes people talk about mistakes as all being good, but sometimes mistakes have damage and, it, and there are things to avoid. And so we want to be, what I talk about is diff four different kinds of mistakes. There's the stretch mistakes, which are the things that we make when we are going outside what we know, experimenting, trying new things. There's the high stakes mistakes, which we want to try to avoid and minimize. There's the sloppy mistakes, which is a, the mistakes that we make that we should have known better. And either they're light and they're sources of, of humor to laugh at, or if they're meaningful, we can kind of reflect on them and think about what, how do we change our systems and habits to avoid them in the future. And then fourth, there's the aha moment mistakes, which are things that uh, we realized that we did what we intended to do, but it was the wrong thing to do. And those are precious sources of mistakes as well. Uh, but the stretch mistakes are what we can focus proactively on by figuring out what are the times and spaces where they're not going to create a lot of damage, but that are going to lead to learning and improvement. That's awesome. Well, obviously the book has a lot of, you know, good uh, resources, both on like the individual side and the team side. And I, I want to ask you more about it, not to give too many spoilers of the book, but tell me a little bit about your background. Obviously, you know, the past jobs that you've done and the mentorship that you have with Carol, but how did you get to this place where you said, hey, I'm going to put this book together? Was it from, you know, facilitating workshops? Was it the culmination of everything that you've seen in teams? Was it just what like drives your own like personal growth and development? Like how did the apex of your career lead to to this book and also where you're at in your work? Yeah, well, the, that's a long story. I'm going to try to make very concise and focus on just a few things. But I grew up in Venezuela just trying to 
meet society society's expectations right like get good grades and then get a high paying job or like a job with high status like investment banking and i was just i wasn't pursuing anything that i was particularly interested in or that i was passionate about and eventually i became physically sick i got a significant repetitive strain injury i was losing my ability to use my hands and that made me realize wow i can't take my hands for granted i can't take my ability to do things for granted i better do something that i feel will make a difference in other people's lives so that's why I went to grad school. I met, I was introduced to Carol. We started this organization together and I did not plan. So, so I did not plan to be a, a public speaker or to write a book, but in trying to, in becoming passionate about a growth mindset and building a learning culture, I started first like needing to, to communicate this message. And there was an opportunity to do a TEDx talk that, you know, Carol couldn't do. So we decided that I would do. So that was a big challenge for me. I did, I thought I was just going to do 10 minutes, like go to stage, do 10 minutes and be done. Cause I was a strong introvert, but I thought I could like take on that challenge for 10 minutes. But people started asking me to do public speaking after that. It's the talk has now been viewed by over 4 million people. And so that I, surprising to me, I enjoyed public speaking. I became good at it. I continue to work to get better always. But that was the first surprise. And then the, the second surprise was that the book was, uh, was not something that I was planning to do, but someone whom I didn't know, Chip Conley, I just asked him a question about something else. And he he suggested we talk for 20 minutes. And in that in that conversation, he suggested, hey, like, have you thought about writing a book? And can I introduce you to a literary agent? I was like, wow, yeah. So, so that started a journey three years ago, worked super hard on it, interviewed over 100 people. Um, and here we are today. The book's been, you know, recognized by the next uh, big idea club as a must read. And uh, is uh, I'm just really excited about this being the biggest contribution I've made so far. That's awesome. I love so far. What do you think drives our, the cumulative hour interest in performance. Four million people have viewed this, you know, viewed your TED talk to, to elevate the performance. Why do you think it's such a hot topic for people? Well, we get stuck, you know, we get stuck on trying we have so much to do. We have a long to-do list. We have so little time. And so we just focus on getting through the to-do list, getting getting things done. And we think we have this vague sense that in order to improve, in order to succeed, in order to get ahead, all we have to do is work hard. All we have to do is get things done as best as we know how. And that's the best route to success. And we do that because we haven't been taught otherwise. You know, in, in school, everything is graded with a letter or a number. And so we actually learn in school that what school is about is to perform, is to do to show what you know, rather than to do things that you don't know how to do, looking at mistakes and, and tinkering and exploring and driving your own curiosity. And so we all learn to perform instead of how to learn throughout life. And then we get stuck in 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 this par pattern. And so when we come to see that pattern and what to do differently, you know, it's unlock unlock for many people. Can you expand unlock unlock? Yeah, I mean, it's just we realize, for example, in our organizations, the leaders might be focused only on helping on, on on encouraging the people to execute right we need to execute we need to perform and that's important performance is how we get things done but if we only send that message then people might be trying to minimize mistakes all the time that's going to lead them to be in the performance zone all the time and the organization is going to stagnate and so we don't see that we think that that's the way to succeed so when we realize you know the way that a great athlete gets amazing at what they do is they do something different than play matches you know they they don't just try to focus on what they already know how to do during practice they go to the coach and say coach i'm having trouble with this move let's work on that and that's very different than what we do when we're performing on the match and so when we realize we're spending all our life and our work just getting things done as best as we know how and that's getting in the way of our goals that unlocks you know oh like there's, there's a different way that I can work and live that is going to, you know, with less effort is going to lead me to more growth and higher results. Interesting. So you talked about developing a learning culture earlier. You've obviously talked to a lot of people in your time as a facilitator, speaker, et cetera. You know, how, how does one balance the urgent with like the urgent day-to-day, -day, hey, I need to do stuff with the investment into future growth and development. How have you seen people prioritize that time in learning development when it seems like there is always so many things to do? And then, you know, to add on to that, how can our listeners take the stuff that you're sharing and implement two or three things, whether that's for CEOs that want to help their teams uh, develop that or an HR people learning and development function that really wants to expand, like pouring into their team. So that's a big question. Take sure. as long as you need for, for that one. So 
<laughs> so, you know, if you think about it like a, an athlete or a performance arts person, they have the, the privilege or the benefit of being able to devote hours each day to just improvement. We, most of us don't have that. Most of us have too much to do in too little time. And so for most of us, the greatest opportunity is not in like blocking time in our calendar to do deliberate practice or to read more, although those things are wonderful if you can make the time. But the biggest opportunity for most of us is to shift the way we get things done so that we get them done not only with one goal, which is to get things done, but with two goals, to get things done and learn and improve along the way. And it doesn't take more time. It's just about what we pay attention to and what strategies we use as we're getting things done. So for example, you know, we, we should, if we're always doing the same thing in the same way every day, there's no way we're going to be improving because in order to improve, we have to change. So we have to be identifying what is at least one thing that I'm going to tweak or change in how I'm going to approach this next conversation or this next meeting or this next presentation or this next spreadsheet that I'm working on, whatever it is, you know, whatever, first, not try to improve at everything, but what is important? What is the one thing that I want to be working on? And what am I going to do differently or try differently in order to see whether that works better or not? So that that is a basic thing to do. And, and I would say that so the biggest opportunity is to be working most of the time in a different way but the, to, to get started on that, if we're not used to doing that, we want to do something that's easy and quick to do, but very, very frequent. So every day, for example. So we want to identify what is the one thing that I want to work to improve and remind ourselves every morning of what that is and how we want to work on it so that every day we are finding opportunities to, to work and improve at that one thing. And through time, we are go that's going to get us to think differently and to find other opportunities throughout the day so that we can accelerate over time. Cool. Do you have any kind of practical examples from people either that have read your book, did your TED talk, you know, done the work where they say, hey, this was an area that we've worked on? Because as we look at teams and as they implement their strategy, they're saying, hey, we want to improve communication or we want to improve customer experience or we want to improve our technology or we want to improve our process. You know, can you share a couple of stories of people that have done that easy, repetitive task and approach that kind of continuous improvement mindset to it? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a very simple kind of example that had a huge impact was uh, a barista at, at Starbucks. Her name was Teresa Sabatago, and she was having trouble remembering orders. So she was making lots of mistakes. She was asking her other colleague baristas, like what customers order to remind her, and that was frustrating to them. And so the, the very simple thing that she she was going to get fired. She was failing at her job. And she proposed to her colleagues, hey, what if we write the order on the side of the cup? Would that work here? And their, her colleagues uh, said, sure. Like they, they didn't want her to continue uh, asking them. Um, so so then they, they, they wrote it on the side of the cup um, and it worked great for them. So Tracer started getting other shifts in other nearby Starbucks and then coming to them and say, hey, can we please, you know, write the order on the side of the cup? And they would say, no, that's not the process. That's not what we've been asked to do. That's not brand consistent with our brand uh, because the company, you know, expected the baristas to remember the order. And so Teresa, luckily Starbucks is, is um, asked for feedback all the time from their customers and their staff, which is such a powerful strategy. And so they opened the door for Teresa to suggest this practice to, to corporate headquarters. And that has become, you know, a global practice now because it makes life easier for the baristas. But, you know, LinkedIn, the top 100 leaders, they wanted to change the conversation that they have on a weekly meeting so that it's not just performance. They, they wanted to embed learning into that weekly conversation. So a really easy way to change the conversation is to change the agenda. So they included a different section of the meeting where anybody's invited to share something they learned the prior week and what the implication is. So what, what anybody in that group can do differently going forward as a result of what they learned. So there's a lot of examples of kind of what are the systems and habits that that we're using to perform, but also to improve and how do we continue to change those systems? Yeah, absolutely. I just find it so interesting because I was talking to a CEO today about you know the outcome, the performance of his team. He said, well, we've been doing all of this stuff. We've been doing all of this stuff. We've been doing all of this stuff. And I'm like, well, you're not getting the results. But I say, well, why don't you change how you're doing? Like you're obviously not 
having the one-on-ones or getting the those outcomes. And I think that's like a super great way to reflect, hey, are you getting the outcomes? How do you shift it? And then the other thing that really stuck with me about, um, you know, the, the four types of mistakes, because an organization like a Starbucks, like a Netflix, you know, small mistakes done at scale can be extremely cumulative, whether those are the mistakes you learn from, and they're likely not the high ones, but those little teeny mistakes, the ones that in SMEs, their death by a thousand cuts. Those are the ones that'll destroy your profitability. Those are the ones that will really challenge. So uh, how would you, Eduardo, as you look at an, a small or medium organization that's really trying to instill the culture of continuous improvement, of learning, as well as performance, what are one or two things that they can uh, implement today to help you know, elevate that experience? And one of them you touched on was you know seeking feedback, but any other ones that you'd recommend to our listeners? Yeah, so first is to like see how the, what what they're doing might be chronically performing and how that might be problematic. And so the way to an easy way to do that is you could distribute uh, like my TED talk on it is ten minutes. You can send it to your colleagues, say, "Hey, watch this," and we're gonna go into a meeting and say, like, "What do people think about this? Do we think that?" Are we engaging in the learning zone? Is that useful? Do we want to engage in the learning zone? Are we doing it? Can we improve? What do people think? Do we want to do this more? And how do we want to do it? And just have a start a conversation, right? Rather than dictate, this is what we're going to do from here on. Like start a conversation with your colleagues. What do people think about this? What which what is something that people are interested in working on together? Uh, and so whether it is like you said, feedback. And with feedback, often people go to we need to give feedback more. That's how we're going to learn, and that's fine. But a much more powerful ways to encourage people to solicit feedback all the time. Because we, when we're soliciting feedback, we make it a lot easier for the other person to give it, and we make it a lot easier for us to receive it, and we make the feedback a lot more useful and specific to what we're interested in. So whether it is feedback, also kind of reminding uh, ourselves of what it is that we're working to improve. So whether that's, you know, in our weekly meeting, we're going to remind ourselves of here's one area that we're working on. Uh, how is that? And we, if we want to, if we have time, we could talk about how is that going and, and do we continue trying in the same way or trying in a different way? But basically figuring out what's important to us and how are we going better at it and let's align on what we're going to do together to get better at that. Yeah, I love that. I think it's so interesting, you know, from a balance of performance busy and the improvement. Um, I see some organizations that are so busy, air quotes busy, that they don't want to talk. They don't want to have meetings. They don't want to, you know, take the time to develop in that learning because everybody's got so much going on. But when you can incorporate that learning at scale um, through something small as, you know, watching a 10 minute, you know, TED talk together, um, it can have like the investment is is huge 10 times a hundred times, a thousand times or more, uh, like what happened with Starbucks. And so I think it's just so, uh, so important, so impactful. And I really look forward to sharing that video with our audience so they can check that out. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, just as we finish up, Eduardo, any other kind of words of wisdom, any other kind of key parts to the book that you'd like to share with our listeners uh, before we finish up today? I would say a lot of us have gotten into, I did, and I, I think a lot of people have kind of just lived life in a reactive way, just in terms of what society expects of us and not really had an opportunity to pause and think about what's important to us, what's most important to us, and how do we pursue those things that are most important to us? And and how do we get better at those things that 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 we care most about? So that's just an invitation to to think about that. Well, I love that. I think it's one of those things. What, what I hear uh, from your own journey, and this is just my own assessment, that you say, hey, you know, I want to be able to do something because I'm supposed to, because I'm supposed to have status. And then through that, your own learning, right? You had to go through the, your own journey and to say, hey, how can I have uh, impact? And it sounds like, you know, that uh, there are tens of millions of people that you've impacted due to your <laughs> hand injury and everything else. Um, I, I just I thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for chatting with me. Thank you for continuing having to impact like the work that you do both individuals and teams because it makes a huge, huge difference. And so uh, I'm grateful that that's what you're doing. I'm grateful that that's the purpose. I'm grateful that you found your purpose. And I look forward to uh, to seeing more about what you contribute. So um, where can people be impacted by you greatly? Where can they connect with you? Where can they learn more about your work? And of course, pick up your book. Well, I have a monthly newsletter on my website, brisenio.com, my last name.com. And the book, The Performance Paradox, is available wherever books are sold. 
thanks Anthony for having me and for all you do. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, folks. My guest today, Eduardo Briseño, who is the author of The Performance Paradox. Uh, one of the things I took away from today's interview is just you don't have to separate learning from doing, but you do need to take the time to uh, learn while you grow and while you do things. So Eduardo, thanks for being a guest today. It was a pleasure chatting with you and I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Anthony. And folks, I wanted to also thank our show partner, Affinity Staffing, affinity-group.ca slash SME. Uh, they're our partner here if you're looking to add great talent to your team and hopefully instill a talent of or a, a team of people who are committed to continuous improvement. Check them out. They're great partners to help you find great talent. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Anthony Taylor. Thank you, Eduardo, again for being our guest. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. And I'll see you everybody next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review. We appreciate you listening and following along. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And as Anthony says, until next time.